important to the issues I'm going to be talking about today, um, but I think I can give you a um, kind of introduction to some of the issues. Um, first of all, I think it's important to uh, mention who the Uyghurs are. Um, they're mostly Muslim ethnic group in the People's Republic of China. Uh, they speak a Turkic language closely related to the Uzbek language of Uzbekistan and the former Soviet Union. And more, they're more uh, culturally related to the peoples of Central Asia than they are to the majority Han population in the People's Republic of China. Uh, they're a fairly large group between 11 and 12 million in China, but that is still only about 0.8% of um, the population of China. And um, it's important to note that um, the region where the Uyghurs live, which they, they consider their homeland, um, is also home to other uh, mostly Turkic peoples, uh, Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, Uzbeks, and a lot of the things um, that I'm talking about today that are happening to Uyghurs are happening to those other groups as well. So, um, what is happening uh, in the Uyghur region of China? Um, and I should mention, you'll hear this region called Xinjiang, uh, which is the Chinese word for new territory, which tells you a little bit about uh, how the Chinese government sees this region. But most Uyghurs um, prefer not to use that name. Um, a lot in diaspora call it Eastern Turkestan, which relates to um, a uh, relates to two short-lived independent states in the region in the early 20th century. I tend to call it either the Uyghur region or the Uyghur homeland. Um, and now you've probably seen some news reports and uh, I imagine the thing you've seen most of all is about the mass internment camps, um, which of course immediately um, raise a kind of historical memory of mass atrocities of the past, um, uh, including the Holocaust. Um, that is the most headline grabbing aspect of what's happening. And um, what we know is that since 2017, um, the state has arbitrarily uh, interned about a million, maybe more uh, Uyghurs and other indigenous peoples of this region in uh, what, what the state calls re-education centers. And they're uh, framed as facilities to deprogram extremists, um, kind of a de-radicalization program, um, but they're really akin to prisons. Um, uh, and uh, the students do, or the, the, um, the people in, in the internment centers, um, I wouldn't really call them students, but they, they, are, they are forced to take um, Chinese language uh, classes and classes about state ideology, but um, they're prevented from interacting in their local language um, and they're completely surveilled the whole time they're inside these internment centers. There's no certainty when they can get out. Um, they're, they're punished for not following rules and there's been reports of torture and many reports of sexual assault, um, which I think can be expected in any kind of mass internment system of this size. And in, in addition to you know, the hundreds of thousands, perhaps more than a million Uyghurs in these camps, the state has also imprisoned uh, hundreds of thousands of Uyghurs since 2017 mostly on political charges. Um, so at least 10% and probably much more of the population is now in some form of penal institution. The other thing you may have heard about from news reports is the mass surveillance um, outside uh, the camps and prisons. They're also inside the camps and prisons, but really the more ominous aspect of this is um, outside. Um, and what you've probably heard about is kind of the, um, the high-tech high um, aspect of the surveillance. It uses um, artificial intelligence, facial recognition, tracking of cell phones, um, following of internet behavior, also, also um, you know, a lot of human surveillance too, um, from work, from 
neighbors and so on. But really the most ominous aspect of this is that it's all compiled into a large database known as the Integrated Joint Operations Platform that basically um, allows security uh, you know, at a checkpoint or, or some other uh, context to just at the stroke of a key, bring up a file on any person um, that has information that can be evaluated uh, as to the, the level of loyalty to the state or um, as the government would, would frame it, um, the level of extremism or um, how much they're prone to possible extremism. Um, and also this is bolstered in rural areas by an army of cadres from the Communist Party who visit and ostensibly live short term with Uyghur families while taking notes on their behaviors. And all that information also goes into this massive database. But these two aspects of what's happening, I, I see them as the cornerstones of a complex of destructive policies that are happening um, outside the penal institution. So the fact that you have these camps and prisons, the threat of being interned or imprisoned, um, the mass surveillance that ensures um, that you, you, you can't confidently uh, believe that anything you do or say is not observed, creates a situation where anybody who's not incarcerated um, has really no recourse of resistance. Any resistance in any form can be detected and result in imprisonment or internment. And this allows the state to remake the region and its people um, at will without resistance and, and create kind of an illusion of volunteerism. So, I mean, one of the things that is interesting about what's happening is you'll see on social media um, uh, and you'll see Chinese media um, trying to push counter narratives um, that there's nothing nefarious happening in this region. Um, now, some of the things that is that are happening outside of those cornerstones of this, this complex of destructive policies is uh, you have uh, numerous, uh, numerous policies trying to force or, or coerce assimilation. Uh, and this includes the active suppression of Uyghur cultural expressions and language for um, those who are outside penal institutions, uh, coercive mi mixed ethnic marriages. So there's a state campaign um, to promote Chinese men marrying Uyghur women. And um, essentially if a Uyghur woman or her family turn down a hand in marriage, um, that's um, a, a, an immediate sign that um, they could be accused of extremism and suffer consequences. Um, and there's increased uh, mandatory uh, Chinese language boarding schools for children. Um, here, you know, it, it's really reminiscent of kind of the boarding schools for uh, Native Americans um, in the United States or uh, for First Nations in Canada. Um, and and, and the, the people who are interned or imprisoned um, uh, their children are often uh, relegated to these boarding schools where they're essentially raised um, in a uh, Han Chinese milieu. And there's coerced uh, participation in Han holiday celebrations and suppression of Uyghur holidays. And th this sometimes gets to the absurd, you know, during Ramana Ramadan, which is um, right now, um, the state, you know, holds uh, beer drinking competitions in, in Uyghur villages. Um, and if, if you refuse to participate, that would be a sign that you might be an extremist and there, therefore be relegated to internment or imprisonment. Um, there's also uh, removing signs of Uyghur cultural legacy. Uh, for Uyghurs, um, uh, there, Islam in this region is highly influenced by Sufism, um, and that includes a, a lot of uh, pilgrimages to the tombs of saints that are really important to Uyghur culture. And here's an example where you see basically the destruction of one of these um, pilgrimage sites uh, over the last, you know, there's 2011, and this is what it looks like in 2019. Um, there's also the demolishing and repurposing of mosques 
you know, mosques become restaurants or uh, cafes, um, destroying of religious shrines, uh, destroying of civilian cemeteries, um, removing traditional architecture, demolishing entire Uyghur villages. Um, and, and part of the uh, way that they're able, the state's able to demolish Uyghur villages is there's uh, a massive program to, to put people into residential labor programs at factories. And this, this again, you know, separates families and um, a lot of the people who are relegated to these labor programs, their children end up in boarding schools. Um, these programs in part are connected to uh, the re-education centers, these mass internment centers. Uh, when somebody is, is deemed um, to have graduated from re-education and deprogramming and has, has demonstrated they're loyal to the state, um, they uh, are consequently allowed to uh, participate in one of these labor programs. But there's also um, a, a big movement um, to take people, particularly in rural areas, and put them in these residential labor programs. So kind of a, proleta a proletarization of uh, rural Uyghurs. Um, and a refusal to participate, uh, again, can result in charges of extremism. Um, in these programs, there's restricted movement, um, and um, they include also in the evening Chinese language classes and classes on the Chinese Com Communist Party's ideology. Uh, people are forced to work in a Chinese language milieu with Han supervisors, um, and they're frequently removed from their hometowns and family. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, with children being relegated to boarding schools. And some of these factory complexes are in the Uyghur region. Others um, are outside, they're in inner China. In fact, they've been dispersed all over China, which is raising a lot of questions now about um, supply chains that get into uh, consumer products that we by um, in, in the US and Canada. Um, and, and I think really you can see um, that this is a sort of ethnic cleansing. It's trying to remove these people, right? Um, and a, a recent um, Chinese state-sponsored study praised these programs for their impact in reducing Uyghur population density in their homeland, which, which kind of speaks to this goal. Um, and finally, there's increased evidence of forced sterilization and limiting of births. Um, official documents show that sterilizations in the Uyghur region increased fivefold from 2016 to 2020. And this is primarily uh, focused in the areas where there's a Uyghur majority population. Uh, and during the same period we've seen in those areas with Uyghur majority population, um, the birth rates plummeting uh, each year on top of each other. And um, this seems to be a state-led effort to thin out the Uyghur population. And it's important to note that, you know, the Chinese state has long done this for um, everybody in terms of trying to limit births. Um, but recently it's let up on that um, among the majority of the populations, but they've increased that effort uh, in the Uyghur region. So I look at this as a cultural genocide, which, which is not meant to um, comment either way on the more contentious question of whether uh, what's happening should be termed a genocide by international uh, law. Um, this is, um, I refer to that as a, it, this is a cultural genocide primarily because I think it links very well um, to the intentions of what's happening. Uh, it's, it's very reminiscent of um, what's happened to other indigenous peoples elsewhere in the world. Um, it's, uh, it's very similar to other attempts by settler colonists to sever uh, the native peoples to the um, attachment to their land, break their solidarity and destroy their identity uh, prior to developing uh, and settling said land. Uh, so North America, 
Australasia are examples you can point to. And so in this sense, it's more about territory um, and in the territory that Uyghurs um, and other uh, local native peoples view as their homeland than it is about the peoples themselves. The aim is to remake this region as an integral and generic part of the People's Republic of China uh, and a society steeped in Han-based culture more likely for service, uh, most likely for service as a major hub in what's called the Belt and Road Initiative, which I'll discuss a little more in a second. Um, so I, I think it's important to note that um, the, the idea of cultural genocide does not preclude um, this larger issue of genocide. In fact, Raphael Lemkin, uh, who is, is viewed as kind of the person to have coined the term genocide, um, viewed this kind of cultural destruction as uh, a critical component of genocide. Um, and he defined genocide as the destruction of a nation or of an ethnic group. Um, he notes that that does not entail uh, the immediate, or doesn't necessarily entail the immediate destruction or mass killing of the group. Instead, it's usually carried out gradually by eradicating a group's cultural distinctiveness and way of life, what he calls the essential foundations of the life of national groups. And uh, I, I think you could similarly say that uh, a lot of what's happening in the Uyghur region appears to violate the UN Convention on Genocide. And uh, there's various efforts now by legal experts looking at exactly that question. Um, so, uh, you know, as I mentioned, cultural genocides generally associated with settler colonial regimes, which seek to settle and develop new land. Uh, in, in such instances, the indigenous peoples of this land are viewed at, at best as superfluous and at worst as an obstacle that needs to be removed. And again, um, we can only look, uh, we can look to, na to Native Americans, Australasian Aboriginals and their experiences as being very similar. Of course, um, uh, at least a hundred years before, but still um, it's, it's a very similar process we're seeing. Uh, just aided by uh, more high-tech forms of uh, oppression. So I, I argue this is what China is seeking to do in the Uyghur homeland. They want to push out the indigenous population, sever their attachment to the land, destroy their solidarity to prevent resistance, and erase their culture. Um, and I think it's, 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 it's very troublesome to see um, something that we associate with a different era uh, rearing its head now in the 21st century. Um, and I think it's important to understand um, why that might happen. So, um, you know, people, when I talk about um, settler colonialism happening in this region, people will often ask me, um, how, could, how could you talk about that now when this region has long been part of China? Um, but there's been this kind of gradual colonization of the, the region, and it's, it's essentially transitioned from being a frontier region to being uh, a zone of settlement. So the Qing Empire, which was the last empire of China, conquered the region in the 1750s, but it was driven out in the 1860s. Um, and that, that first hundred years of control were really not... Um, not very penetrating. Um, they were, it was essentially seen more as a dependency of the Qing Empire. But when the Qing Empire comes back um, in the 1870s and they reconquer the region, um, they incorporate it as a province of, of the empire called Xinjiang or New Frontier. Um, and, and there's an attempt to have kind of a, a, a civilizing mission and assimilation campaign that largely fails. Um, and then when the Qing Empire falls, its territories remain part of the new Chinese nation state. Um, and if you know much about Chinese history, um, from 1911 to 1949, uh, the strength of um, the emergent uh, Chinese nation state was, was um, very weak. It was, it was not very strong. 
Um, and essentially this area was kind of an appendage ruled by administrators with tenuous relations to central Chinese um, officialdom. And um, so really you don't see an attempt to integrate this region into China until 1949 and, and the communist revolution. Um, and we do see between 1949 and 1980 an attempt to do that, which I think is, is hampered in part by uh, the state's um, uh, uh, inability or lack of capacity to really um, uh, develop uh, the entirety of its territory. Um, but what does happen is you see the Han population increase significantly, but mostly in the north of this Uyghur region. And um, the region as a whole still remains more or less a frontier of Chinese communist rule. Um, and so just to give you an idea, um, the population of this region totally <coughs> is um, upwards of 40% Han Chinese. Um, and uh, so close to half um, Han Chinese, half indigenous. But, um, you know, up to 2000, these are the population figures for 2000, that yellow area in the north was 60% Chinese. Um, and um, the area to the south, where the majority of Uyghurs live, uh, was only 12% Han Chinese. So you see this, um, uh, you, see, you see the potential for still a much larger colonization. And 2000 is when that really starts happening. Um, and I think to understand why that starts happening in 2000, it's important to look where this region's located. Uh, so it's located um, at the northwestern edge of China, which, you know, um, until uh, the reform period in China was seen as um, a buffer zone to keep nefarious influences from uh, the West out. Um, but after the reform period, it's become um, kind of outward looking. Uh, the Chinese economy is much more focused on export. And um, under Xi Jinping, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative wants to build um, Chinese um, economic expansion outwards, um, developing infrastructure for trade and so on. And this region becomes critical to that. As you can see, it, it leads into the former Soviet Union, further on to Europe, um, to the uh, south, it goes into Afghanistan, Pakistan, leading to um, the Persian Gulf. Uh, it, it's also um, the closest uh, kind of connection to India. Um, so I think there's mostly economic motivations for what's happening. Um, and that could be as simple as the, the Chinese economy is in constant need of economic growth now. Um, and this area uh, having been underdeveloped provides a, a fertile ground for such economic development. Um, but it's also been a become a critical site for commerce. And increasingly, you know, as I mentioned, the, these these residential labor programs uh, for production. Um, and this importance is magnified by this Belt and Road Initiative, which is an important part of Xi Jinping's um, kind of foreign policy. Um, and it's, it's envisioned that this should be a critical hub for economic activity, um, and particularly uh, reaching out to the West and Southwest. And as a result, um, I, I think that the Chinese government essentially wants to clear the land of uh, its indigenous roots and um, redevelop it as a generic part of China. Um, so uh, just in conclusion, I'd say that, you know, this is a cautionary tale of the capacity of states for undertaking colonial projects in the 21st century. Um, and I think that, you know, this definitely relates uh, to the concept of genocide. Um, I think it's, it's, it's actually um, less akin to um, what we saw in the Holocaust and more akin to what we've seen happen to indigenous peoples during the, 
the peak era of, of colonization, in particular settler colonialism. Um, I think it's not really, uh, it seems that it's a, a long gradual colonization, but even if you look at um, the Americas, um, uh, in particular North America and the US and Canada, um, you, you initially had settler colonialism in the East that then expands to the West. And um, it's a gradual process where a frontier transforms into a, a site of settlement. And I think that inevitably has very grave consequences for indigenous peoples. And I think it's, it's an issue um, that, you know, the, the international community really has to take a firm stance on because it sets a very dangerous precedent um, as we're entering uh, kind of a new um, geopolitical configuration around the world. And what, what are the international norms that um, we want uh, uh, everybody to observe? Uh, so I'll leave my comments at that and um, questions. So as I mentioned, um, if you have any questions, please type them into the question box. And while you're doing that, I'll start the questions off with, uh, just because you ended up ended off with the international community, I guess my question has to do with what response has come from the international community? So, um, you know, it's been, um, I'd say, uh, the United States has been um, particularly vocal. Uh, a lot of European countries, Canada, Australia, um, you know, kind of a, a lot of um, what's often seen as uh, the, the democratic world um, has been vocal about this. Uh, I think one of um, the unfortunate aspects of um, that is that, um, the Chinese government has kind of countered that in the developing world by saying, oh, this is just um, the United States ganging up on China because China is becoming more powerful and the United States wants to maintain its hegemony around the world. And while I don't doubt that there's some, you know, kind of conservative, uh, we call them in the US neoconservative policy people who, who look at it that way, um, I think that you know the the lion's share of um, response to this is very much um, a humanitarian response, and and I think it's a response that's also thinking, well, you know, if we're headed to a more multipolar world, uh, what are going to be the expected global norms, um, and you know, how will the the international community respond to mass atrocities? Um, so I think that uh, you know. I guess my answer would be that the international community is responding. Um, I think that it's it's very difficult to leverage um, anything on China, which is very powerful economically. And in fact, you know, we see this problem constantly. I think everywhere in in Europe, in the U.S., in Canada, and elsewhere, that you know, um, everybody's worried about. Um, speaking out about this, what's that going to do for our trade relationship? Because um, that's such a key part of the global economy now. Um, I actually think where there may be leverage is um, in, on the economic side, um, which means that you have, you know, states have to push back at special interests, economic interests that have large economic investments in China. But, you know, this situation is only going to change if the Chinese government decides that it's going to change. And I think that can only happen if powerful people within China realize this is not in their best interest. And um, I think for that, you know, kind of um, economic issues are the ones that um, can can force the most, most leverage. and. And the, the Chinese state has kind of put itself in a corner on this issue because, as I mentioned, these, these uh, forced or coerced labor programs are sprinkled throughout 
China. So as advocacy groups start looking at what um, products may have Uyghur forced labor in their supply chains, they're coming up with lots and lots of products, you know. And so recently there was a, um, there was a, uh, something where a lot of companies using um, processed cotton from China in their production lines um, were uh, basically forced to, to confront this issue because essentially, uh, I think it's 86% of the cotton in China comes from this region and involves um, forced labor. And um, so a lot of companies said they would not source cotton uh, from this region. And the Chinese government um, kind of initiated a, a, a social media campaign among Chinese citizens um, to boycott those products who said they would no longer source cotton from there. And this included Nike and H&M um, and some other ones. And, and so it's, it's, uh, it's, I think that that's the arena that might change. Thank you. Um, another question, just because we have students that are attending, um, if they were interested, I mean, certainly you have your book to, that they can read and certainly, um, but is there something that they can do to, to, you know, obviously to learn more, but, but is there something they can do to sort of, if they have an affinity towards mm -hmm. following this up, how can they do that? Yeah, I think <laughs> um, it makes sense to um, seek out uh, Uyghur organizations. One of the things that this um, situation has um, kind of spurred is that um, previously, you know, uh, the Uyghurs in exile, um, there was a small group that was politically active. And now virtually all of them are politically active because this crisis has touched on all of them. Uh, one of the things that people are in turn for is if they have family abroad. So virtually all of the people, all the Uyghurs um, abroad have family members who've suffered um, during this time. And um, in, in Canada, um, I believe it's the Canadian Uyghur Association. Um, I can try to dig up uh, their webpage for you. Uh, in the US, there's a very good organization called the Uyghur Human Rights Project. Um, and a lot of these, these organizations are interested in, in developing links with university campuses. Um, and so I think that there, there is ways to become involved and um, you know, it'd be, I think one of the best ways to do that is, is reach out and find Uyghurs in your community who um, might already be working on initiatives that you can assist with. Thank you. Another question from, from uh, the community. Um, if this cultural genocide is mainly motivated by economic and trade interests, why do you think that the Chinese government hasn't explored other less horrific ways of satisfying their economic goals? <laughs> yeah, you know, that's an interesting question. Um, I think there's a couple aspects to that. I think one of it is, one aspect is um, just kind of the longstanding um, colonial attitude towards the region and, and the resulting structural racism. So um, even though, uh, you know, I would say for the last 20 years um, prior to this crisis, um, there was a real attempt to incentivize Uyghurs assimilating. Um, but there, what, what happened was there was an inevitable uh, glass ceiling because there, there's this you know, kind of quandary that I think uh, is, is an outcome of colonialism where um, the colonial power wants to assimilate um, the people they've conquered, but they also don't want to accept them as equals. 
Um, and so that that's one aspect of it. Um, I think the other aspect, uh, I didn't go into this, but my book goes into this quite a bit, is um, this has been propelled in part by the global war on terror. So um, after the fall of the Soviet Union, during the 1990s, um, the Chinese state was very concerned about um, ethnic self-determination. It kind of, I think, wrongly diagnosed the problem with the Soviet Union being um, giving too much ethnic self-determination, um, where it was really kind of an economic failure. But um, as a result, there was a, a campaign during the 1990s against what um, the state perceived as Uyghur separatism. So any kind of um, uh, expressions of uh, nationalism, cultural uniqueness, and, and, and any idea that might promote self-determination was, um, was cracked down on. And then after 9-11, um, the Chinese government essentially um, pivoted that uh, campaign um, and said that actually these separatists are really terrorists and they're linked to Al Qaeda. Um, and there's a very unfortunate uh, aspect to that story because the US government um, recognized one small little known group of Uyghurs in Afghanistan as being a terrorist group, which kind of validated this, this narrative that um, this was a terrorism problem. And I, and I think that in some ways, um, you know, a lot of scholars talk about mass atrocities and genocide requiring the dehumanization of the, the victims. And so, you know, if you look at um, the history of Native Americans, um, that dehumanization was this idea of savages. And I would argue um, post 9-11, in the Western world, um, there's been kind of this adoption of the idea of terrorists as also less than human. It's, it's become a dehumanizing term. And to complicate that, there's no international definition of what constitutes a terrorist, which allows states to kind of uh, arbitrarily label various opponents um, or people they, they see as problematic to be terrorists. And I see that that's, that's kind of what has happened in China. And I think that's helped facilitate the dehumanization of these people. And, and I think a lot of people carrying out these policies actually think, and this is the same way I think a lot of colonial regimes operate. They think they're doing this in the best interest of uh, those communities they're destroying because they're, they're essentially making them human again, um, you know, by saying, we're going to break down this culture, which is backward and is prone to terrorism and extremism, and we're going to make you civilized again. Um, okay, so the, there's no more questions. I'm going to just give you one last chance, to everybody, to sort of ask a question um, while I'm uh, thanking <laughs> thanking Dr. Roberts for attending and participating. Um, thank you so much for shedding light on on this very important topic um, as we move forward. Um, as we know, here in Canada, the Parliament has uh, has adopted uh, the idea of genocide. Um, I don't know that if that's um, a global, not global, that's a bad word. I don't know if that's a unified idea throughout Canada, but certainly our parliament um, has adopted that stance. So thank you very much. Um, and, uh, and thank you for your time. And oh, and we have one more question that came up. Um, how did the topic become important to you? Somebody wanted to know. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, so I, um, uh, I'll try to give the short answer to this. Um, I, I was very um, interested in communism when I was in college and I was unable to study in the Soviet Union. I was studying Russian, but I was able to, to study in Yugoslavia as an exchange student in 1987. And uh, when I got to Yugoslavia in 1987, I realized that nobody in Yugoslavia was interested in communism. 
But um, the issues that were important were nationalism and Islam. Um, and so I decided I wanted to study Islam in the Soviet Union. And in my last year of college, I had another opportunity to study abroad um, in the Soviet Union. It was the first time American students had been able to study at actual Soviet universities. And I studied at um, Tashkent State University in Uzbekistan. Uh, and when I got there, you know, uh, I found that most of the literature about the relationship between um, Muslim peoples in the Soviet Union and the state um, that I had read in the U.S. was actually quite flawed because, um, you know, they, a lot of scholars had said there was a, a real threat of uh, a Muslim revolt in the Soviet Union. Um, and I found that was really not the case. The, the, um, there was, you know, there were racist problems between Russians and Muslims, but, um, you know, they also lived together um, in the dormitory, you know, they drink together and um, uh, there was no, there was no real, you know, kind of concerted um, anti-state feeling. And during my vacation, winter vacation, I went over to the Uyghur region of China and realized that there the, the, uh, relationship between the state and um, the Uyghur population was very different. There was a lot of animosity um, and it was much worse. And it was curious because um, as I mentioned, Uyghurs and Uzbeks are very closely connected, um, but you see people who are um, essentially very closely related having very different responses to two different states. Um, and so that, that's what originally interested me. And then I did my dissertation work um, after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, mostly in Kazakhstan. And I would travel over to the Uyghur region of China and I was looking at the relationship of Uyghurs on both sides of the border as they uh, kind of became reacquainted with each other and the various issues that that brought up. Um, and so I've been studying Uyghurs ever since, uh, and I've in particular been following the situation of Uyghurs in China, you know, which, which has been bad for a while. Um, and then, uh, you know, when, when the present crisis kind of happened, I realized that it was very important to, to focus on it. Um, in fact, uh, my colleagues, everybody who, studies Uyghurs around the world, I think has, has become involved in the situation because um, we suddenly found that people we knew were disappearing um, or their family members were disappearing. Um, and we've, we've kind of seen, we've kind of realized that, um, you know, we have to uh, also uh, kind of become activists in the sense of spreading the word about what's happening because um, it's an area of the world that very few people know about. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Roberts, for your time. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Bye. Bye.